Thank you very much. So, I'm a science presenter. I present science on stage and on TV. So, I'm always on the lookout for new ideas, new experiments, new demonstrations, things that I can engage people with. And it's always uh, a really good feeling when you stumble upon something or you discover a thing and you just think, yes, I know this is going to work. I know that I can present this in front of an audience and it's going to be brilliant. Um, and so I want to tell you about uh, when that happened recently. I came across something and I thought this is going to be absolutely great, but only if I can solve one big problem with it. And so that's the story I'm going to tell you, but I'll give you some background first. I, uh, I studied physics at university and at the same time I started doing stand-up comedy. And, and that was kind of, you know, it's uh, fun and everything, uh, and stressful and hard. <laughs> the stand-up, not the physics. And uh, when I graduated, I, I got a job in technology, and I carried on doing stand-up comedy on the side. And that was fine, you know, I was doing okay at stand-up comedy, and, and the technology job was fine. But I kind of, I missed the science, I missed the physics and, and all that sort of stuff. And so one day I decided to see if I could combine science with stand-up comedy. And, well, okay, so fast forward that story to the present day. And um, yes, it is possible, you can do it. And I've just finished a tour uh, with Festival of the Spoken Nerd with Helen Arney and Matt Parker, which is our little comedy show that we do about science. And, uh, and of course, I wasn't the first person to have that idea. A lot of people are doing it really well now. Uh, but back then, when I first started, uh, I, I, kind of, I was building shows for school kids. And I was trying to persuade people that they should book me with my silly sort of comedy show about science. And I got a few gigs under my belt when I got a phone call from someone who said, can you do a chemistry talk for some school kids, for about a thousand school kids? Now, the answer to that question is no. <laughs> I cannot do a chemistry talk because I didn't study chemistry, I don't have a chemistry lab, you know, I can't get access to liquid nitrogen and all that cool stuff. And I said, I, I, you know, I told them, I said, yes, I can do it. <laughs> of course I can do a chemistry talk because, um, you know, fake it till you make it, right? <laughs> and, and, um, and also, like, there were, there were some really big names on the bill and I thought, you know, I can't say no to that. I've got to be on the same bill as these people. This is brilliant. So I said yes, I think, you know, I'll work out the details later. And, uh, and so I did, I, 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 I had this brainwave, I thought, I'll do a, a talk about polymer chemistry. Because polymer, I see polymers are really interesting, but polymers, it's basically like plastic and rubber and that sort of thing. The kind of things even a physicist can get hold of. So that was my talk, it was going to be about polymers. And this is when, I was putting this show together, that I discovered a brilliant demonstration, but that was brilliantly problematic. Um, one of the, my favorite polymers that I discovered uh, when I was putting this talk together is sodium, um, no, sorry, polyethylene oxide. Um, polyethylene oxide is a brilliant example of a polymer because it's an incredibly long molecule. And this is the thing about polymers. They're just really, really, really long molecules. And polyethylene oxide in particular is incredibly long. It's so long that it has this amazing property of being very viscous, but also elastic at the same time. And it means you can do this really interesting thing with it. If you try to pour polyethylene oxide, you only have to start pouring it, and it will continue to pour uh, on its own. <laughs> Let's see if I can make this work. This is a bit more full than I maybe should have made it. <laughs> Don't worry. That's kind of weird, isn't it? It just keeps going. Okay, there's still a bit left. Let me, let me try that again. Okay, here we go. That's pretty <laughs> freaky, isn't it? Isn't that amazing? So it's a self-siphoning liquid. And when I discovered that, like, oh, wow, self-siphoning liquid. That's awesome. Now, that's not the demonstration that had the problem. The demonstration that had the problem was the one that I used to explain what was going on in that one. Because I had this wonderful demonstration, but I wanted some way for the audience to be able to visualize what was going on at the molecular level. And I saw a brilliant demonstration. It was uh, Steve Spangler. He had some Mardi Gras beads, you know, these sort of plastic beads, a chain of beads. And he filled a pot with these plastic beads. And amazingly, if you start to pour the beads, the beads will self-siphon just like polyethylene oxide. 
So I thought, OK, this is great. I'll use that as my kind of model of what a polymer is like. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm not going to use plastic beads. I'm going to get some metal beads because they're shiny, and that would be nice. So I decided to buy some metal beads, and I bought 50 metres of uh, metal bead chain like this. There are about 8,000 individual beads, one long chain like this. And sure enough, it self-siphons. So if I start to pour this thing, it will keep going. But it also does something very strange that the plastic beads don't do. And I'll show you it now. The chain rises above the pipe. So I thought, I'm definitely going to show them that. <laughs> but there's a problem. And the problem is, I have absolutely no idea why it happens. <laughs> and the thing, look, explaining things is my job, right? So if I can't explain something, that's really bad. <laughs> so that I need to work this out. I have to find out why it goes up before it goes down. And I asked around, has anyone seen this before? No one had seen it before. And I tried to do some equations, and my equations were terrible, and it just it didn't work. So I had an idea. I decided to make a YouTube video, because I thought, if enough people see this, then eventually I'll receive an eloquent explanation in the comments. <laughs> it turns out I've really misunderstood YouTube. Uh, <laughs> but, but no, but I, 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 I learned a lot. Um, I learned that my experiment is fake and gay. Um, so. <laughs> YouTube comments, they're just wonderful. Uh, <laughs> but actually, the, 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 the YouTube video was viewed now. It's been uh, one and a half million views, which I'm very proud of. Uh, and it was discussed on uh, a website called Reddit. Yeah, of course, everyone's favorite website. Uh, I'll show you now. I don't know if I can um, have a look. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the, the, the discussion on uh, Ask Science subreddit. Just a brief uh, discussion there. Uh, <laughs> And I, and I followed the chain, right? And, and I followed the discussion, but I don't think they got to the bottom of it. So I made another decision. I thought, right, what I'm going to do, I'll film it in slow motion. Because then I'll be able to pour over the footage and I'll be able to work out exactly what's going on. So I asked around, does anyone have a slow motion camera? And this company got in touch, Earth Unplugged. They said, come and do it with us. So ladies and gentlemen, I can present to you, in slow motion, beads coming out of a pot. Yeah, it, right? Isn't that wonderful? Um, and so, uh, and now it's going backwards. What? Not really. Uh, so <laughs> I'm just looping it. But anyway, uh, oh, also, look, we managed to catch this beautiful thing. Um, this kind of like corkscrew shape, just frozen in space. So even though the chain is moving, the corkscrew is staying where it is. Wonderful. And so I poured over this footage, and eventually I worked out that a slow motion video doesn't help. <laughs> um, but this, uh, that video was viewed at two and a half million times. And eventually it came to the attention of some academics in Cambridge. And they decided to write a paper about it. <laughs> um, so, Understanding the Chain Fountain by Biggins and Warner. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? Uh, in, the, in the Proceedings of the Royal Society A. Um, and uh, look at that. Uh, it goes shorter than the discussion on Reddit. Um, and look, in, in the references, there's me. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, their, their, their explanation is really cool, and I'll see if I can explain it to you. Their, their sort of insight was to think about the flexibility of the chain. Right? The, the chain is very flexible, but if you try and flex it beyond a certain point, um, it becomes rigid. It becomes, you know, you, you can't bend it beyond a certain point. So it's flexible and then it becomes rigid beyond a certain point. And they looked at the mathematics of that, and they saw that it was very hard. So they ignored that and uh, looked at <laughs> something a lot easier, um, which is, that's how you do physics, by the way. If it's too hard, imagine something easier. Um, and so they imagined like a, a simplified version of this. So they imagined you've got a chain that's got rigid sections joined by flexible links. So rigid, flexible, rigid, flexible, rigid, flexible. Basically, a chain of rods, uh, like 
this. So we've already got uh, a bit of the chain that's in motion. This is being pulled up by some more chain up here. This bit of rod here is about to be pulled into motion. So we can look at the forces involved and we can see that this rod here is about to be pulled from that end like that. But the center of mass of the rod is there, which means that when the rod finally moves upwards, it doesn't just rise, but it rotates as well, meaning that a part of the rod ends up lower than where it was before. But that can't happen because the rod is resting on something. There's the pile of chain underneath it or there's the bottom of the pot. It can't move downwards. So instead it pushes against what is beneath it and it feels an equal and opposite reaction force pushing upwards like that. So Biggins and Warner's bizarre conclusion is that the reason the chain rises above the pot is because it's pushed by the pot. <laughs> a fantastic discovery. And, and, uh, and you know, this, this explanation, I kind of, I stole it from the video that they made. They made a video called Understanding the Chain Fountain to accompany the paper. If you search for it on YouTube, I recommend you watch the whole thing. It's brilliant. Uh, it includes this explanation. Um, I do want to play a clip of the video for you. This is Mark Warner talking about the, pro uh, talking about the project. We wanted to see whether or not we could blend this uh, research project, because nobody understood the mold effect with the Ooh, problems now, that the children just, uh... are doing. Let me just play that again. Because <laughs> nobody understood the mould effect. The mould effect, <laughs> yes. I mean... Look. I don't, I don't think even Einstein has an effect. <laughs> um, you know, this is good for me because like, I always used to worry, like, if I have kids, you know, it's going to be tough, like, at school. Like, it's hard having a surname like Mould, you know? <laughs> but now, I mean, it's, it's going to be like, what, Mould? As in the Mould effect. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, this is a very good theory uh, for uh, why the chain rises above the pot. And what I mean by good theory is that it is testable. It makes predictions that are potentially falsifiable, and that's a, a good marker for a theory. And one of the predictions that their theory makes is that the higher the chain, the further the chain has to drop, the higher the fountain will rise. So this is Biggins now standing at the top of a staircase at the Royal Society. <laughs> cool. There we go. Uh, they do really good stuff at rutherford-physics.org.uk um, where basically they're using uh, things like this to inspire kids to look at real physical problems in the world uh, and, uh, and do proper physics about actual things. Uh, so, so check out the work that they do there. Um, that's kind of the end of the story. You know, it started with this thing that I accidentally discovered and then via YouTube and you know, slow motion camera and, and these academics in Cambridge. And finally, we have an answer, which is amazing for me, except, you know, what can I add now? You know, so I've decided to add what I always add when I've run out of ideas, which is dubstep. So <laughs> Oh, thanks.